absolutely delighted to have Chip Rui here with us today. He is the Principal Chief Investment Officer and founder of Rui Invest Asset Management. He has over 30 years of value investing experience with leading buy-side financial institutions, including Third Avenue Management, Kramer Rosenthal Mc McLean, and Slow Twiseman Mary Murray and Company. He worked alongside value gurus Marty, uh, Marty Whitman, Jerry Kramer, and Laura Sloat. At Third Avenue, he led the value equity strategies as the lead portfolio manager of Third Avenue's flagship fund, uh, flagship value fund, lead portfolio manager of the company's small cap fund, and lead portfolio manager of the 15 to 20 name uh, concentrated best ideas strategy. Prior to joining Third Avenue, he was senior vice president and senior portfolio manager at Kramer, Rosenthal, and uh, McGlynn, overseeing the small, mid, mid, large and all cap value investment strategies, as well as the concentrated 20 position strategies. Prior to CRM, uh, he was senior portfolio manager at Sloat Wiseman Murray and Company, where he worked directly with the founder, Laura Sloat, on investments and portfolio construction. He began his career as an associate at Smith Barney Shearson. Uh, thank you for joining us, Chip. Thank you for having me and thanks for putting this together. Quite an effort, very impressive. Yes, uh, we're very uh, glad to have you. And uh, yeah, great. So let's dive into the presentation. Sure. Um, so I thought what I'd do is give a little bit, you, you gave my background um, a little bit more on that and go through a presentation that I'll use uh, for clients, but focus more on my philosophy. And then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A and uh, looking forward to it. So I'm not a Zoom expert, so everybody uh, hold on while I try to share my screen. Is that working? Can you see that at time? Yeah, it looks terrific. Okay, perfect. Um, so I founded Rui Asset Management um, in really the kickoff Jan 1, 2019, um, after 32 years, uh, 30 years actually, on Wall Street working for the firms that I mentioned. Um, it's an RIA and I do managed strategies. Uh, the main flagship project is a small mid cap value strategy. I also have a wealth management business um, that's more traditional. Um, this, this slide, uh, I think uh, Itai uh, went back over, hold on a second, um, went one too far. And I'm not gonna repeat everything there, but I, you know, I think what's interesting is I really have worked for three value bureaus over my career. Uh, Laura Sloat, um, who's, uh, you know, a few books have been written about her. She's, you know, very impressive. She's been blind since she was six, uh, built a woman-owned firm uh, on the value side. I worked for her for about nine years. Um, and, and I say everybody taught me a different thing. Laura taught me to have vision um, uh, on what a company can become. Um, and, and so that was kind of drilled into me every single day. Uh, I went to um, Kramer Rosenthal McGlynn, where I worked with Jerry Kramer. And I would say, you know, his main strength was the behavioral investing side of the business, really understanding it. I mean, Jerry was probably one of the only people I know who could sell a stock a minute later say, oh my goodness, here's a new piece of information. That was a mistake. We got to get back into it and buy it right back. I, and not that that happened that offer, but taking the emotion out of investments is critical success. And I think Jerry's among the best. And then I went to take over uh, Marty Whitman's uh, global value strategy. Uh, Marty, very, very traditional, uh, deep value, relying on book value, uh, balance sheet first. So that really, um, you know, melded well with a lot of my uh, training and, and my belief on how you should look at a company for downside protection. And, you know, those, the, the types of value investors you might see are really three kinds. You, you'll see the traditional compounders, the Warren Buffett, um, you know, kind of the deep value, the Marty Whitman, price the book, and then kind of Garpy, uh, um, you know, change uh, catalyst driven styles. Um, I've kind of worked for all three. Um, and I would say, you know, if you're looking at compounding, it, the, the positive there is long-term focus. The, the negative is volatility in this market's really, really accelerated. And, you know, we're, I, I like to be a long-term investor, but when you see 15, 20, 30% moves in stocks over a period of weeks or months, um, you know, just sitting back and saying, this is a nice compounder, it, you know, you have to take advantage of, over an undervaluation a, a little bit as well. 
Um, when you're looking at um, kind of traditional deep value, I, you know, clearly balance sheet protection is very important there. Downside protection, I think, is something that's really overlooked in this market. I call it downside risk management. Um, and, you know, it's risk versus reward. And I think after 10 years of QE and just downside not mattering by the dip, you know, looking at a downside and looking at protecting capital is going to be very important going forward. And that's critical to my strategy. Um, that's the positive of a book value strategy. The, the negatives you can get hung up on there is it is backwards looking. Um, it doesn't take into effect um, any forward looking statements. I've had conversations with people who do that. And I feel like I say, we're driving 80 miles an hour towards a brick wall. And they say, well, we've been on this road forever going the same way um, because they're looking backwards and I'm looking forwards. And it, so you need to take both into um, consideration. Also accounting has really destroyed um, book value in a lot of ways through buybacks, through um, you know legal risks, through pension, through um, CECL, which is a financial accounting, and you know, lots of things have destroyed or, or changed book value. So there's tons of adjustments that you need to make if you really want to do that for a real book value that works. The last is catalyst driven. I, I think it's great because it means you can participate in a company while um, the upside is there. So you've got the first two um, pillars there. Uh, you know, but again, if a catalyst or a change doesn't work out, it doesn't work out well, you, th there might be no investment case supporting you. You might have attracted what they call hot money or momentum investors. So again, if you just focus on, you know, core GARP change, you, you really don't protect on the downside and you're kind of putting too much of your vision into the forward look. Um, yeah, I've been doing this for 32 years, I, I, and I, it's my view that you can take the best of all sorts of these and blend it. And that's what I attempt to do with my philosophy, which I'll get into, which is, you know, balance sheet first, downside risk management is a first pillar, um, ability to grow. And I think value investors need to remember that growth is not um, an antonym or the opposite of value. We, we all want to own things that grow. We just don't want to overpay for them. Um, and the last is kind of a uh, valuation. Valuation matters. It always matters. There's some great companies out there that are too expensive. Um, and as Jerry Kramer would say, are you hoping for return on capital or return of capital if you aim to buy that? And, you know, it's an important lesson. So, you know, with, with that, um, this is a little bit about what I do. I won't spend too much time here. My strategy is concentrated. Uh, 15 to 25 equity uh, holdings, um, you know, active share, if you know what that is, it's the percentage of your performance um, different from the benchmark. I, I'm over 95, almost 99, just because I'm concentrated. I think concentrated is where the market for active is going to go. Um, the growth of passive, the growth of ETFs, um, and, and the cheapness, uh, investors of all sorts, pension funds to individuals are attracted to that. If you're going to be active, you have to be different and concentrated and have conviction. Um, it, you can make a real difference. I, I say there's over 6,100 companies in my universe. I aim to own about 25 or less. Um, there's always something to do. And, and that last point, I'm a patient buyer. I don't own the market. People talk about the market. I look at what the market does, but then I look at what my 25 holdings do. So, um, and they can be quite different. And, and, and that's the goal on the upside, of course. Um, moving forward on that, here's my philosophy, downside risk management, ability to grow in valuation. Um, we covered this a little bit, so I'll jump forward uh, to a little bit. So. Downside risk management, it's its kind of, you know, be careful, you know, I, at first, protect capital. If you protect capital, you can live to fight another day. Um, and that's hugely important. If you're an investor and you destroy your capital, you can't come back. Um, so, you know, I look for things first, uh, balance sheet first. What I'm looking for when I say, you know, risk management on the downside low levels of debt, that's going to be important for the next few years. Uh, you know, a lot of you don't remember the 1970s. Um, you know, I would ride my bike down to 7-Eleven and buy a, buy a pack of bubble yum for 15 cents. A week later, it was 20. A week later, it was 25. I mean, inflation is, is horrible. And if you've got variable linked debt, 
um, you know, those payments are going to accelerate. So watch out for debt, watch out for um, floating debt. Um, and you want companies, if they do have debt, you know, you, you can make a lot of money with the appropriate amount of leverage, but it has to be well covered by operating cash flow. Um, look for off balance sheet liabilities, look for on balance sheet liabilities, pension, um, legal risks. Um, and you don't want to be in a company that has to raise debt or equity in a downturn. Um, it gets ugly quick. Um, I, I saw it in the energy crisis when the utilities were forced to raise capital. I saw it in the financial crisis when the banks were forced to raise capital. The market will dictate massive discounts because they can. You don't want to be an equity holder. You want to be in a position to provide equity to those companies at times. The ability to grow is, is really compounding. Um, the metric I favor is return on invested capital. And remember, value, you know, growth is not the opposite of value. Um, that last bullet point there, um, I don't want to own a company that cannot grow. If it's a melting ice cube, um, if they're destroying value, if they can't return a, you know, a ROIC over their whack, what are you doing? It, you know, you're not going to create value. So you know, when people talk about growth versus value, um, they tend to associate growth versus anti-growth. So you know, be, care, be careful of how you hear things and what labels are. Um, you know, there's a lot of value investors that, that don't like that I say that, but it's true. I, you don't want to own something that can't grow. And, you know, if you look over a three to five year period, a typical Porter analysis, um, you look at their peers and, you know, I'll talk more about this, but figure out how your companies make money and how they're going to do that for the next five years and what their competitors can and can't do and that they have the balance sheet to support it. You'll do just fine. Last one is valuation. You know, you, you need to invest patiently, um, but when it comes to a price point you want, you can act with conviction. Do your work before, um, you know, here's, I, I look for at least a 30% discount to my, you know, fair value estimate. That's kind of where I think it should be trading the market, by no means a takeout value. Um, I don't build takeout values into my price targets um, just because it might not get taken out. Lots of the companies I own do get taken out um, and can get taken out, but a fair value is where it should be trading today. Um, I look at a lot of tools. I look at normalized free cash flow. I look at earnings, discounting cash flow, some of the parts. Um, again, it's like it, a lot of people that rely on one metric, I don't understand that. I look at them all, I triangulate them. They really should all point to the same solution if you do it correctly. If they don't, it's a reason to dig quicker. If if free cash flow and, and discounted cash flow point to 20 bucks and some of the parts is, is pointing to 40 bucks, um, you know, that's where you should be spending your work. You know, what are you, what are you doing? Why is that different? And that could be a competitive advantage or it could be, you know, maybe you're wrong on that last one or the first two. So, um, you know, valuation matters, look for upside versus downside always. And, you know, if you're starting to value things on clicks or eyeballs or searches or members or anything else, you're getting into trouble. Um, I, I've seen it over and over. Um, moving on a little bit, uh, so, um, it's important if you're an investor, you know, most, if, you, if you're looking for a job, if you're a student, if you're looking, if you're, you know, considering hiring a manager, um, you want to see what the process is of an investment manager. You want to see that it's repeatable. You want to see that they can find ideas. Um, and you want to see that they can continue to find ideas. This is, this is kind of how I do it. It's really hard to put in a visual, but this is the best I could come up with. I think, again, in the small mid area I specialize in, there's over 6,100 U.S. companies. Um, the Russell 25 Value Index, which is my benchmark, has 1,847 companies. This is why I'm not a big fan of benchmark investing. If you stick with the benchmark, you're, you're leaving out over 4,000 companies. Um, and there's always plenty to do. There's always something to do. Um, my favorite way to find companies is fundamental. I call it connecting the dots. You know, read the 10Ks, talk to the management conference. You know, listen to the conference calls. The, you know, the tone of how management says something is important. So if you're reading a transcript, you, you probably should listen to the voices too and how they answer questions. It, it, mesh it up. Um, look at their investment presentations. 
Um, look at how a company makes money, do sensitivity analysis on raw materials, tariffs, political geographies, know where your company makes money. I mean, this week, look, it, it, there are a lot of companies that had big data centers and big workforces in, in the Ukraine, and it's a terrible situation over there. Um, but, but you shouldn't have to go to your 10K, you know, in a panic, you should know that before you go in. Um, and, you know, the other way I'll find ideas if I'm working on a company, you know, my favorite story ever is a, visiting a helicopter facility up in Canada. They were messing around with graphite um, composite instead of metal, but they couldn't drive fasteners through the graphite because it was cracked. Um, so they had found a new glue that held as strong as uh, fastener or steel and held it together well. Well, the next question is who makes the glue? I, you know, so, you know, think like that, connect the dots, you know, go find that company and see if it might be worth buying. Um, you know, I do use screens. Um, everybody should. Um, but, you know, just they're commodities. So, you know, be careful what you're doing. You, you know, if you just look for PE or EBITDA, it's not going to tell you anything that investors and quants and computers can't see. The stuff I'll screen for is what's in my philosophy, low or no debt, net cash, high and improving ROIC. Um, revenue earnings and book value compounding, you know, underperformers over three months or three years. Um, if does the sell side follow it at all? I hope not. And if they do, minimal coverage or mostly neutrals. If it's all buys, you know, where's the neglect? Where's the undervaluation? You know, if, if when things get better, if I can find one that'll get better and it's all neutrals, it's fun when they all rush to upgrade and raise their price target. Um, you know, and again, things matter when they matter. This is, uh, I'll step this up, it takes a longer. So work in process, um, we can come back to this. If anybody really wants uh, this presentation or any of these slides, you know, please email me, contact a tie or contact me. Um, it's not a state secret, but you know, I wanna leave some time for Q and A and there's a lot here, but I, I, I call it WIP, uh, work in process. Um, it is a funnel, several steps, create a financial model, Finalize an investment case. An investment case is why you own it and what your price targets are. Put it on paper. That helps you remove emotion. Um, it helps you make a good sale when your price goes up. It helps you make a good buy if your price goes down. If it's not on paper, it gets emotional. You can't remember anything. So, you know, I would say all the work that you do after you're done, after you buy a stock, take some time and just document why you did it. Um, I say I either buy it, if it passes all my screens, I either buy it or I put it in my bullpen. My bullpen is like a baseball pitcher's bullpen. There's somebody ready to come in. My portfolio competes for capital every day. Um, it does. If there's a better idea, if I sell something or a better idea comes along, it'll fight its way in. Um, or if something doesn't have a discount enough, say it's got a 20% discount and it's slammed down 15, 20%, and it's got better upside versus downside than something I own, I'll quickly revisit it. But if that holds true, I'll consider swapping the name. Um, so, you know, having extra completed investment cases around um, and, and having those compete to get into your portfolio is, is a good situation. And again, I, I'm not a big believer. There's never nothing to do. This is a little proprietary. It's how I build a portfolio. You get your investment case right. You get your price targets right. Portfolio management is easy. We all want to be PMs. Being a portfolio manager takes about five minutes if you do it right. You know, the best PMs are analysts. Uh, remember that when you talk to anybody. Um, this is the way I try to think through it um, in my head. And this is kind of what I see. I grade my companies, A, B, C, D. I take into account cyclicality, competitiveness, ROIC, balance sheet, everything that we talked about, and it's purely subjective, but how comfortable I am. Am I very comfortable as an A or not comfortable at all? Is it a D? Um, on the other side, there's my upside to price target. And it's just a graph. If, if I have a company that is an A rated company in my mind, and I have 50% up, it's going to be a maximum. To, why not? Right? Load it up. If it's a cyclical company, um, you know, chemicals, metals, um, you know, I, 15, 20, 30% probably isn't enough to own it. Um, there's a lot of volatility. There may be, you know, or, or if it's a company three times levered, it's a lot for me, or something else is kind of wrong. I don't really want to own it unless I see 50% up and then it would be a lower position size. So position size would kind of be high to low. Or if it's a utility that's doing great, 
has a five yield, you know, good balance sheet, good service area, but maybe 15% growth, it, you know, it's borderline. Why do I want to own that in a concentrated portfolio? Um, I might own a small position. So, you know, that's the way I think about building the portfolio. Um, it's not all upside versus downside. Don't make your most upside price targets your biggest positions unless the quality aspect justifies it. Um, I've seen that go poorly over my career. This is another way um, I think about risk as a portfolio manager. We all look at indices and we look at sector exposures. I tell you what, sector exposures don't tell you anything about risk. They really don't. Um, you know, what's your China exposure? Look at that company, you know, Graph Tech and Hillebrand, EAF and uh, HI and Herc are all industrials and PLAB is a technology company. They all have China exposure. But if I'm looking, you know, I don't see that. Um, I, I can see uh, other things that aren't here. And I, I, I take my risk ratings and, and sort them too. I don't want to have all A's. I don't want to have all B's. I don't want to have all C's. I like to mix those. Um, you know, a good example of what I'm talking about is travel exposure. Um, and just hypothetically, if you own a hotel, you know, that's going to be in consumer. You could own a International Flavors and Fragrances, which is a, a chemical. You could own a Boeing, an industrial. You could own, um, you know, Avis, car rental, which might be in business services. And those are all going to be classified separately, you know, according to an index. But if SARS is going to happen or COVID is going to happen, all those, the markets are going to fall out because you have a lot of travel risk in your portfolio. So when I look at risk correlations, that's I, I'm trying to see how my portfolio behaves on any given day. And it's on, not all negative. Um, I look at activists vulnerable. I love to get activists in my portfolio. I think there's a lot of companies where an activist could have a field day. Um, I'm not an activist. I'm more of a constructiveness. I'll talk to companies, but I, I don't file 13 Ds. Um, I, you know, I, I try to do my coaching behind the scenes, so to speak. And I pay attention to what I don't own. And again, I don't have a lot of energy, you know, so, you know, that's something I have to consider uh, during uh, this part of the market. Um, the other stuff here is more specific to me. Here's something that's important to talk about, sell discipline. When, when is it time to sell? Well, the good news is your price target has been reached. Um, a lot of times I've seen analysts just never want to sell anything. They, they buy it. It doubles. It's a big position. They love it. it it's, it's confirmation bias. They don't want to sell it. It's like pulling teeth. It's like, no, it's time to sell. You know, Bring the cash register, give a high five, sell your stock and buy something else with a better risk reward. Don't write it back down, especially if there's not a lot of upside left. And if it's really played out, you have another idea. And again, having other ideas is critical to almost every, all portfolio management. Um, we talked about more attractive risk versus return. If I get a better trucking company, a better bank, you know, considerably so, um, you know, then it's time to buy the new one and sell the old one. And, you know, if the investment case breaks, if, if you're expecting something to happen, if you thought I had a good balance sheet or something bad happens, and look, bad things do happen, um, don't be a defender. You know, if you don't have an investment case, there's no reason to be there. Sell it and move on. Put the capital someplace else where you can make money on it versus writing it down. And, and, and that's important. Um, and again, if you have a written investment case and you have reasons you want to own it, and you're looking at a piece of paper and they're not true anymore, it does remove the emotion from I was wrong to it changed and now is a good time to sell. Especially if you're going to be working for a larger firm, um, you know, it's important to do that. Um, that's about the end of my presentation. I kind of flew through it, but I, I thought maybe, um, you know, since this is more student focused, I'd give you just some reflections. And if you Bear with me. Again, I've been doing this 32 years. When I started, I had more hair than a tie. Um, and look at me now. So um, that's where it all went. Um, the biggest piece of advice I could give anybody is think for yourself. Um, if you're going to be an analyst, if you're going to be a portfolio manager, if you're going to be successful, you're going to have to have independent opinions and you're going to have to find things out on your own and you're gonna have to make decisions that others aren't on the same page with, have not come around to yet, or are unpopular. That's how you're gonna define yourself and be differently. So don't let somebody tell you that your idea stinks 
Um, you know, and don't let, you know, somebody tell you that you shouldn't buy more stock and don't let somebody tell you you shouldn't sell the stock because it's overvalued. You know, think for yourself, have reasons, back them up, but definitely um, think for yourself. The other thing, especially if you're going to be an analyst, if you're starting out, read the 10K. I can't tell you how many times uh, people that have been, you know, the sponsoring analysts on a company uh, come to me. They don't understand how the company makes money, where they're located, what the balance sheet looks like, what the cash flow statement looks like what the accounting conventions are. It's all, the, the 10K is just like a little answer key to your company. Think of it that way. Read it, read it more than once, read it twice, print it out and have it on your desk. Um, it's important. Um, you know, that's everything that they're telling the government is in there. They put everything in to avoid lawsuits. So it's a great place to start. It's not where you should finish, but definitely where you should start. Um, if you're gonna have an investment case, think like the CEO, this is the Laura Sloat vision. If I was running this company, what would I do? How would I make money? Why, you know, why is the company not doing this? Why is the company doing this? That's the kind of conversation you wanna have with the management team. You don't wanna call them up and ask them what their EPS was or how many shares they had or what their debt looks like. That's all in the 10K. If you get management on the phone, ask them the things where you're thinking for yourself. Go back you know, and how you're gonna differentiate yourself. What's your vision? Would you spin off this division? Would you buy back stock? Why is your balance sheet unlevered? Why are you three times debt? You might three times debt might be too little, depending on the company. You know, scares scares me as a value investor, but um, you know, if they're growing and you know it's all locked in, it might be fine. Understand acronyms. You know, during the financial crisis before it, um, I had no idea what the banks were doing with CDOs and CLOs uh, to the extent that they were doing it. Uh, my first job on Wall Street was buying, you know, pools of securities. We didn't call them CDOs or CLOs. When I found out that they had changed the nomenclature and that's what they were, um, it helped me get the firm I was with at the time out of anything with CDOs and CLOs, and we avoided a lot of the carnage. So if you see a new term and you don't know what it is, you're in a conversation, you're in a meeting, somebody throws it around, Google it, understand what it is. I, I'm just telling you... Um, don't pretend you know what it is or pretend, you know, feel bad that you don't know what it is. And, you know, in the right situation, ask. Um, remove emotion from the investment process. It, you know, it, emotions have you make bad decisions. And, and you know, I, I wrote a blog on that on my website um, just recently, www.reallyassetmanagement.com. Um, I was going to show you that page. Maybe we could get there. I will. But, um, you know, emotions can make bad decisions. Removing emotion makes good decision. Um, reject labels. I've talked about that, you know, value, growth, core, GARP, good management, bad management. It means nothing. You know, just because your stock is down doesn't make you a bad manager. And just because it's up doesn't make you a good manager. And you can make a lot of money with a good manager whose company is going through a bad time. I had a company report last night, ABM Industries. Um, and they do service, they, they work in a lot of schools um, from Jansan, watching the desks, the front desk, the doors, um, the cafeterias, all sorts of things like that, the cleaning. Their margins, um, you know, now that everyone's gone back to school are 100 basis points higher in that segment than they were before the crisis. You know, that's great, never waste a crisis. They rethought their cost structure, they rethought their people and when they built back, they built back better um, and it's showing in their margins. So, you know, their stock was down like everybody else's. It didn't mean they were bad management and the management did great um, during that downturn. Um, when you're researching something, attempt to prove yourself wrong once you get your investment thesis. When you get the first twinkle in your eye, oh, I think Google this or I think Amazon that or, or company X that, you have your investment thesis form. This is why I want to own the company. From that point forward, everything you do should be trying to prove that wrong. Why is it a bad idea? Why is the balance sheet no good? Why is the management terrible? Why don't they know what they're doing? Why won't the competitors eat their lunch? The more you cannot prove yourself wrong, the stronger conviction you will have to own the stock and actually buy it. When news comes out, and the stock's volatile and there's a chance to buy it, if, you, if you've already been over that risk, you'll be buying it and others will be selling it because they won't understand. Um, 
So, it, you know, it, that's how you should don't don't try to prove yourself right. You know, if it's a waste of your effort. Hunt, be original. That goes back to think for yourself. No portfolio manager wants you to come in and tell them that Apple has a very loyal customer base. Right. I, I mean, they've got 75 sell side analysts writing that every single day, you know, you know. Tell, tell me something I don't know, a company I don't know or something I don't know about a company or haven't thought about. Um, that's how you're going to get your stock bought. That's how you're going to get noticed. So, you know, think for yourself. Um, say I don't know. If you don't know a label, if, if you know, if somebody's, if somebody's asking you, especially if you're an analyst, you know, how much debt do they have or, you know, is their debt, uh, how much of their cash is offshore? If you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know. But then the most important next words out of your mouth is, but here's how I'm going to find out. And I'm going to call the company. I'm going to go to the tank. You know, I forgot, whatever. Just say you don't know. Don't lie. I, I was interviewing somebody once and, and they would never say, I don't know. And so I started asking a series of questions that were unanswerable. You know, how much revenue do they have in Southern Indiana? And I was getting answers. I, there's no way, no way. I, there's no way you could know that. And it just me, it, it, you know, it, it's better you say, well, I don't know, you know, I, do you need me to get it and how important, you know, just keeps you on the same page. Um, don't own a company with the strategy you don't approve of. This goes back to, in my mind, activism. Um, I call it constructivism. If a company's not doing what you want, they're destroying value, you know, unless you're Jana or BlackRock and you're going to get board seats, it's a waste of effort because they're destroying capital and they're, they're not doing what you approve of. So every time something goes wrong, you're going to get disgusted and want to sell the stock and you have no way to influence that change, you know, without kind of forcing it. So, you know, 6,100 companies, you know, know if a company needs a change, but if they're not going to make it, um, you know, you can move on or, you know, just not own that one. Um, and again, once you own something, that's when your research process, you know, should either even ramp up and can continue. Um, every company should compete for capital every day. Um, and you should be researching every single day. Things do change. They get better. They get worse. So, um, you know, don't, don't just buy it and, and forget it and throw it in the portfolio and, and only come back to it every 90 days on a quarterly basis. You know, call the company, you know, call the competitors. You know, if you are a street analyst and, and their competitor is coming to town, go to their conference or go to dinner with the CFO of the other company if you can. And, you know, ask them why your company's terrible. You know, it'd be interesting in what they say. You know, they might point out a weakness or they might just say, no, real strong competitor, you know, but, um, you yeah, know, just keep working on it. So, you know, I, I went a little bit longer, 25 minutes left for q and I, I can talk forever and I've got more to do, but, you know, I'll turn it over to you right now, Atai. Yeah, thank you so much. I thought that was a, a really great presentation and some really terrific lessons to be taken from that. And uh, yeah, excellent. So let's dive into the Q&A. So our first question is, how did you initially become interested in investing and in particular in value investing? Um, great question. So I grew up in Detroit and, you know, my dad worked for an automotive company and it's back to, you know, kind of coming of age a little bit in 76, 77, 78, 80. It was all inflation. You know, it was all down cycle. It was, you know, not fun in a lot of ways. Bubble gum was more expensive every week. Um, and it just kind of made me ask why. It's also why I'm a value investor and why I worry about the downside. I, I you know, kind of first came into the business with downside. My first job out of, uh, I graduated BC in 1990. My first job was buying portfolios of mortgage-backed securities for a, an investment company. Um, interest rates were eight and a half percent on mortgages, 9%. You know, it's it, it, it just you know, just, I, I think back to that and, and I, you know, I don't know, I, I've always kind of been fascinated with that. And also, I guess I've also liked to take things apart. I got walkie talkies when I was young and I played with them, but then I took them apart to see how they work. So I take apart companies to see how they work. So I don't know, it's just kind of a natural fit of kind of where I came from and what I like to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, any advice for students when to know when is the right time to, you know, go and start their own fund or start their own asset management company and how to raise that initial capital? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Capital is harder to come by these days um, without experience and without a track record. Um, and so, you know, unless your uncle Billy is going to give you, you know, 10 or $15 million, no one's going to take you into a hedge fund unless you're going to go to a class B or C fund. And, and realistically, no smart investor is going to look at that counterparty and want to invest with you. Um, I would say, you know, work for teachers. Um, I did, you know, part of it, I got lucky, but part of it, I, I plan. Um, you know, you work for people who are smarter than you. Um, you know, I, I had a philosophy that I was never going to work for somebody I thought I was smarter than, and there's a lot of people I'm not smarter than, luckily, but, you know, they continually teach you. And I would say, you know, Laura Sloat, I sat across the desk from her for about eight years, and every single day was a clinic, um, you know, and then I learned from Jerry, I learned from Marty, and um, I think only when you think you've learned enough and you've also kind of learned how to manage a portfolio of things and you've lost some money along the way, you know, then, you know, it just, you, you will get into a tough market. Um, you will get into a good market. So, you know, if you want to do it right and protect your capital and have it to fight another day, and I'm seeing today, you know, again, the market's got a little volatility and all these hedge funds are shutting down. It, you know, it just, you know, you probably want the experience to, to prosper in good and, and tough markets. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe bring up uh, two case studies of investments you've made in the past, one that ended up being successful and did very well, and another that, you know, the thesis that you had did not play out and the investment failed. Sure. Um, this is a long time ago. During, I'll give you the second one. Um, and, and this isn't like a hero story. Um, I own a company called MBIA um, through kind of 2006, 2007 time period. This is a bond insurer and I've owned it. You know, it, it was it was them in a company called AMBAC that cornered the market. They insured municipal bonds. And basically it was a great business because cities, even if they went bankrupt, like Orange County went bankrupt, they never really go bankrupt. They keep making their payments. And even if they don't make a couple payments, um, they get recapitalized and, and pay all their back payments. So the bond insurance companies really never paid out. Um, you know, again, what changed, um, which, you know, kind of hurt the stock, I, you know, I think I bought it at 55 and sold it at 35, um, was they got into insuring derivatives. Um, it's a whole different business. You can lose money on derivatives. Um, these CDOs and CLOs, they were writing insurance on those portfolios. Those portfolios were poorly structured. There was a lot of fraud in them. We all know what happened, but when it became clear to me what, and again, this is, I looked at the acronyms and figured out the structures and looked at what they were doing and it scared me. And again, a rule is if you're ever up overnight worrying about a stock, sell it the next morning, 100%. Um, when Citigroup busted its CDO back in 2007, I really didn't sleep. I went in and gave my trader the sell to zero order at 5 a.m. Um, so, you know, it, you, you just gotta, you know, things change, stay on them, but I had a great investment case, it changed. Um, things that work. Um, recently, I, I made a lot of money uh, for my clients on a company called Weyerhaeuser. It, it's a timber REIT. Um, but it also has a wood products company in it, which basically means it makes lumber. So they own the trees, they cut them down and they sell them as two by fours. They also um, own a lot of land with the trees on them. And if it's pretty, if it's near a stream on a mountaintop, they'll sell it off to home builders or recreational or park service, whoever make a lot of money on that. Um, in the financial crisis, for some reason, the COVID crisis, I should say, the stock got obliterated. I, I think I had bought it somewhere around 30. Um, it traded down into the high teens. And I thought to myself, you know, there's 40 years of timber growth here. Um, it's not really going anywhere. We need houses. Um, the balance sheet's fine. Uh, and, you know, I think the company was undervalued when I bought it, um, kind of, re underwrote it, went back to, you know, went below my downside, bought a bunch more, um, basically all the way back up to my price target with a huge position. So, um, you know, what worked out there is I had a downside, um, you know, COVID happened, 
COVID wasn't my investment case, but COVID didn't destroy the business. There are a lot of businesses COVID did destroy. People, businesses, look, the airlines and the cruise ships, everyone wants to plow back into them, but look at the amount of debt they had to put on. Look at the amount of debt they had to put on versus the pre-pandemic debt. So um, it was a nice investment case. Uh, there's still things to do there. I don't, I don't think an operating company belongs in a REIT. I think eventually that operating company should get spun out it pays a great dividend, huge cash flow because lumber prices are high. Um, the deleveraging is going to be very strong. Um, they can consolidate. So, you know, a lot of can still go right there. But, um, you know, so I, I haven't exited that position, but that's something that um, I kind of reevaluated on the down. And the investment case, in my mind, perhaps was as strong or stronger. And so up the position. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, Actually, a similar question to, to uh, the commodities you just discussed. Are there any commodities, you know, whether agricultural commodities, whether uh, oil, natural gas, whether metals that look very attractive to you today from a demand supply uh, setup in the long term and that you're making investments in? Um, so my view on commodities and and I, you know, again, I grew up in Detroit. I grew up in Central Locality. Um, you know, I've been an oil analyst, oil investor going back to the early 1990s, metals and everything like that. And I will tell you, um, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. The cure for high copper prices is high copper prices. The cure for high any commodity prices is high prices. Now, yes, CapEx can be sticky in the short run, but not so much as people think. Um, there's a lot of copper out there at these prices. There's a lot of oil out there at these prices, a lot of oil. Um, go, you know, and these are not companies I currently own, but you can on TV, EOG or Devon talks about breaking even at $30. You know, oil's what, 115, 120, you know, depending on the minute these days. Um, there's a lot of profit. There's a lot of free cash flow. Um, you know, think of Saudi Arabia a couple of years ago, you know, they're saying there's no OPEC capacity. A couple of years ago, they put an extra 3 million barrels on the market out of nowhere. You know, it's, it's there. You can drill it out. Um, you can mine it out. Yes, it's harder to get to. It's more expensive than it has been at the past. But at the current prices, it doesn't matter if it's more expensive. The returns are very strong. So, um, you know, if I'm a commodity investor right now, um, don't make the mistake and put high multiples on these earnings. Look, you can look at the cash flow, but um, when you see something at you know two, three times cash flow, perhaps that's not wrong given where the commodity is. Remember, oil was negative two years ago. That was ridiculous. That's when I was looking at buying oil. I mean, literally buy low expectations, sell high expectations. What's more important is to understand how your companies buy commodities and can they pass on the price. If you have an operating company, and look, if you're Amazon and you're buying electricity, you want to know if they're, they've got contracted gas or their market rate natural gas. Now, it won't matter for Amazon, but it might for a local manufacturer or a laundry or anybody else who's buying electricity that you might not think of commodities. So again, go back to that 10K and figure out what their energy costs and what their you know, top five metals that they buy. Um, you know, are they buying titanium for Russia? That, that could be a problem. Um, so at this point, no, I don't think I'm plowing headlong into any new commodities. Um, it, it seems like that's a pretty high expectation area and, and, and I buy low expectations and sell high expectations. And you spoke also earlier about your use of uh, quantitative mechanical screeners. Do you use keyword screeners at all? Absolutely. Um, and there's a lot of services that can do that. And, you know, I probably won't name them. You can look at them. But I, I again, I it, it, think back to the things I like to see. Um, I'll do change screens. I'll screen for spinoff, the word spinoff. I'll, I'll screen for initiates buyback. Uh, you know, a company initiates buyback, they're probably upset about their stock price. So, you know, th there's something to be said for that. doesn't mean you should buy it, but it probably means you should go out and start to work on it. Um, you know, CFO change, a CEO change, um, I'll, I'll screen for that. Um, 
you know, so a lot of those word searches are very important. I know there's algorithms that can do that now and, and now and quants that can do it now too, but, um, you know, keep that in mind. And, you know, the other thing on those searches, if something happens, um, the market has a short time frame and a long time frame, and they might react to a piece of news over a week, you know, or a day, you know, sure the stock will pop after earnings or after something's announced. Typically, the market either forgets or moves on and the stock comes down or it underreacts to good news and doesn't price it all in. So just because of something has popped off a screen or something that you saw, everybody else saw, and there was an initial move, get the work done. If nothing else, put it on your bullpen list or whatever you want to call it, because there could be an opportunity down the road to put it in your portfolio um, and you want to be ready. Yeah, absolutely. And can you speak some more about how you uh, analyze management? Sure. Um, you know, talking to them. Um, again, you know, anybody, you know, email the investor relations. Uh, they'll typically call you back the IR and it's a little bit of a ladder. You know, if, if, if you talk to them and you have good questions, they understand who you are. You can probably talk to the CFO eventually. Um, you know, maybe the CFO, CEO will give you some time. I mean, you're probably not going to get on the CEO of, you know, Procter and Gamble, but if you're looking at two, $300 million market cap company, probably give you half an hour of his time. Um, but you know, before you get on that call, you've got to have some questions to ask. Um, you know, read the Ks, read the presentations, read the conference call, know the markets they're in, know what's going on. Um, you know, the, they don't, the managers, in my experience, love to hear investors who understand their company and really want to ask things other than what's EPS next quarter? Do you think your margin can go from 10.9 to 11.0? You know, if, if you're asking, you um, you know, something like, well, if this facility gets fully loaded, you know, what sort of revenue potential is, you know, how are you getting uh, employees there? And, you know, do you have the business or how much of that future business do you have to win? How much of a risk is this to you? What's the downside of going into a new facility? You know, that sort of thing. Um, or, you know, why would you not build another facility? You know, if I was you doing your job, I'd build another factory. You know, sometimes I've asked questions like that and I've been proven wrong quickly, but you know, at least I got the answer. So look, managers like to tell you about their companies, but you know, they don't want to waste their time with somebody who knows nothing about the company and is just, you know, going to ask them something like, you know, what's your SG&A going to be next year? You might ask them why your SGNA is high, what the factors of SGNA pushing up and down are, and what are the biggest sensitivities for you in your SGNA. That's the kind of conversations you should have. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, are there any industries that you've never invested in uh, in the firm because you feel like they're outside of your circle of competence? Outside my circle of com competence. Um, no, but um, look, this goes back down to every company, bring it down to the balance sheet, the free cash flow and the return on investment capital. Yes, some companies are hard. I typically don't own biotechs, um, you know, because it's just, it, they're too binary. And I don't know if the compound's going to succeed or not, but neither is the management team. Um, and I also don't, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I don't write the drugs. So, you know, there I'm a little less competent, but um, I have on larger biotechs that have a portfolio of products. And if there's a base level of cash flow, approved drugs, you know, the scripts look pretty steady. And I can say maybe I'm buying the pipeline at a discount or getting it for free. That, you know, that's one thing. Um, also, you know, technology is exciting. But, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff out there that I think people are going to get hammered on. And I, again, I wrote a blog on this, Mind the Gap. It's all my days riding the New York City subway. The, the speakers say Mind the Gap. But there's a gap between where growth investors have um, companies and where a value manager would buy it. And, you know, look at Facebook. And, you know, the, the stock's broken. It's all the way down. Look at Peloton. I have no interest in buying either of those stocks here. They're still ridiculously expensive, in my opinion, from a cash flow or DCF strategy. And look, DCF strategies are dangerous right now because interest rates are zero. And 
if you divide 10 by one, it's 10, you raise rates to two, you divide 10 by two, it's five. You know, now compound that out and put it all in the terminal value. Um, and I've written about that on my, so you should look at some of my blog, I've written about that, the, the dangers of DCF investing in these models and these quants. But, um, you know, it, again, I think some of these things, some of these growth companies, um, whether they're cybersecurity or data or, you know, meals that are trading it, you know, 20 times revenue, 35 times EBITDA, they're never going to, I don't want to say never, but, you know, they, they most likely won't live up to their growth expectations. Um, so to me, that's the biggest, you know, I can figure out what they're trying to do, or I can call the management and, and talk about them. And back to management, if, if you, the IR might put you in touch with somebody to help you understand a technical issue that you don't, I've had that, um, or you can find an outside expert. Um, so again, you need to know the levers, you can learn it, you can do the work, but to me, it's more valuation based and having appropriate expectations. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, what are some of the long-term economic impacts that you see as a result of COVID? Well, I, you know, I think to be honest with you, I'm not gonna have a ton of value add here, but I think, um, remote working and using the internet to do stuff like this. I mean, I, I didn't really Zoom before COVID, um, but again, Zoom was great, but now there's Microsoft Office. I, I just got an email that, you know, Outlook is gonna do, you know, a video chat. So we're gonna do a lot of video chatting, a lot of, and a lot of the stuff probably was on the come, but it accelerates it. In any crisis, new technologies are needed and they're developed quicker. Um, and, and that really goes back, um, through any crisis, geopolitical, whatever, over time, you know, things change, things change quickly. After 9-11, we all went through airport scanners. Uh, we, you know, it, you know we, we, the airport scanners got a lot stronger and the TSA is there and now it's there. So I think this stuff will be there. Telehealth will be accelerated. Um, I think one of the things nobody talks about is the amount of stimulus the U.S. government just threw out there. You know, our national debt um, went up nine trillion in the past two years, from twenty-one trillion, almost thirty. It's staggering. It almost doubled. There's thirty trillion of debt sitting on a ten-year treasury, where most of it is, you know, definitely over half. Um, and those rates were under one, you know, and, and now they're crossing over two again. When, you know, when my first class at Boston College in 1986 for finance. The risk-free rate was 10, which made it easy, but that's what the interest rate on a 10-year treasury was. So, you know, doing all your CapEx modeling was easy because the rate was 10%. Um, my God, what happens if the interest rates on 10 years go back to 10%? Um, you know, think of what that'll do to the budget. And all that money that the government threw out, you know, for better or for worse, I, you know, I don't want to get into that conversation, but it's, the, you know, again, remove politics from it too. Just what, what, what the, you know, judge what they do, not what they should do and, and the debt's there. Um, so we got to think about that. We got to think about interest rates um, and, and really what the capital structure of the company is going to be, what it means for taxes and future spending on government programs. You know, that's probably a longer term impact of COVID that people not directly to COVID, but exacerbated by COVID that people may not be fully thinking through. Yeah, absolutely. And how important do you think either a MPA or a CFA is in the investment venture industry and in particular in regards to value investing? Um, look, I, I know people who are good value investors who don't have their CFAs, but um, my strong advice to anybody thinking of being an analyst is get your CFA. Um, you know, I, I also, you know, one of my good colleagues always meant to go back for his MBA, never did because he, you know, did so well at work and the opportunity cost got high. So, you know, I would say, you know, an MBA is helpful, um, especially if you're not happy with your job, if you want to switch, you want to break into the industry and you're not there. Um, if you are there um, and you're getting trained by your firm, it's less applicable. But if you don't have your CFA, people are gonna ask you why. And you're gonna come up against somebody else like Chip Rui who has his CFA. 
it, you know, that's the long and the short of it. Um, get it. it, especially if you're coming out of school or grad school, you know, I got mine right after grad school. It, it was a lot of work, but I just spent two years studying for it basically. And, and, you know, it's a process, it's a hurdle, but um, that's my view on it. You know, it, you know, it, you don't want people asking you your whole life why you don't have it. Now, yeah, that makes sense. Again, I, you know, I, it, it covers a lot of things and, and how much of that skill set do I use every day? Um, you know, that's a different conversation. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, for a concluding question, uh, what are the most influential events of your investing career? Um, I would say the financial crisis to begin with, um, that, uh, made me think about banks and capital preservation and everything like that, uh, differently. Um, you know, if you're Ford and nobody's buying trucks, you can shut the factory and furlough the workforce and they'll come back. If you're a bank and you lose your capital, you're done. It's gone. If you're an investor, if you lose your capital, you're not coming back. It's not like you can turn the electricity back on. So, um, you know, that's really the big lesson. I think 9-11 in the tech bubble, um, look, the tech bubble existed ever since Greenspan said irrational exuberance. It took 9-11 to break it. Um, you know, we, we have a valuation bubble in this market now. It is breaking slowly. Maybe they'll, you know, as Laura so would take, drag them all out into the street one by one. That's probably the best solution for the market, you know, not have them all break at once. Um, but, you know, be careful of overvaluations in, in the status quo. And, you know, 9-11 can tell you they don't call it the unexpected because you see it coming. Um, so that's where my focus on downside comes from. And then just I guess, again, growing up in Detroit in a, in a high inflation, you know, downside cycle, you know, you know, there can be, you know, from the biblical perspective, seven years of fat cows and seven years of lean cows. So, you know, make, you know, try to make your investment strategy and your companies withstand both. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. This is a really terrific session and really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to speak with us today. No worries. Thank you for the opportunity. Good job. Absolutely. Thanks. Have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye.